So I feel like um, a bit of an interloper in this particular panel, um, not being an artist, but being an art historian, um, and yet being asked to speak about artistic practices. Um, and so what I did to sort of appease my sort of interloper feelings about this was um, continue a dialogue I've had with Lubain Himid um, for a number of years now um, and just sort of intensify it in the, in the lead up to uh, today so that I could speak about her work. Um, and I don't think Lubain is here today. She said she wasn't going to be, which kind of took the pressure off. So, <laughs> um, uh, so I hope that I do her some service today. Um, and I'd like to thank David, Sonia, Susan, Marlene and the BAM team generally um, for inviting me to contribute to the conference today and for making the whole engagement with the project such an enjoyable experience. Um, in a sense, it's like suddenly being able to share a well-kept secret, an attentive art historical engagement with the aesthetics of Lubaina Himid's art practice something that a handful of us have been interested in for quite a while now, and I mean quite a while, <laughs> several decades, um, and which I think is finally having some sort of kind of cumulative tumbling effect, um, which is great. In inviting me to participate today, David asked me to reflect on how a close reading of Lubaina's work held in June at a study day hosted by Innova on behalf of the BAM team, at which Lubaina was present, had impacted on my thinking about her practice. And I was asked to do that in 20 minutes. And I can tell you now that 20 minutes won't even touch the sides of how my brain expanded during that day, um, all in a good way. However, what I will do for the next sort of 19 minutes or so, I hope, is to highlight some of the things that stayed with me, that piqued my curiosity, and that I've been thinking about since. One of the things that anyone who has contact with Lubaina is likely to agree on is her generosity. She gives, and her work keeps giving. And I don't want here to get into a philosophical discourse around anthropological or Derridian concepts of the gift, but I do want to think about Lubaina's giving in the light of her practice. And I thought that this recent Kanga painting um, was a particularly apposite summary of an overriding philosophical position. And the Kanga paintings are something I want to focus on a little bit in this talk. Um, and this is a very recent one, almost sort of hot off the easel, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and it, it comes with this slogan, only give and never let things be taken away. I think that's what she does with her practice. It's both advice towards generosity and a cautionary tale, typical of the angled poignancy of many of her Kanga works more of which in a moment. Another interesting issue that arose during the end of a close reading study day was the issue of artistic influence, and in particular, of course, Lubaina's relationship with visual modernism. Griselda Pollock questioned the art historical impulse, both hers and mine and others, to situate Lubaina's practice as always in relation to modernism. Whilst Lubaina confirmed, that's because it is, thank you Lubaina, it nevertheless gave me further pause for thought, and I'm also wondering whether it did for Lubaina as well. Since the study day, she spent the summer working intensely on a new series of nine Kanga paintings, which she refers to as her Walter Benjamin Kangas, produced as a commission for Hospital Field Arts in our broth and some of them currently on the Hollybush Gardens, um, her gallery, their, their freeze stand um, today. And it's this one in particular, uh, the derivation is an illusion, that struck me as complex and pointed. While slogans on kangas, by which I mean both Himid's <coughs> reference in the form of rectangular African textiles worn as everyday items by women, and her painted versions, are generally elliptical, so the slogans are generally elliptical, often intimating a warning against some vague, unknown possibility. This one stood out for me from the others in the Walter Benjamin series, and it stood out for several reasons, and I'll come back to it in a minute. In our group discussions at, Innova's, um, at Innova around Lubaina's borrowings from and disruptions of modernism, the obvious allusion to Frida Kahlo's 
Henry Ford Hospital, 1932, was made, as well as to O'Keefe, put this one on, um, that's very topical at the moment, um, and probably to other high modernist precursors as well. And it was at this juncture when all these allusions to um, uh, Lubaina's borrowings were kind of coming up in the conversation and the discussions that Griselda stepped in to shake us out of our comfort zone and question the issue of artistic derivation. Now, although Lubaina was the first to agree that a dialogue with modernism was central to her practice, when I saw this new candor, I had to wonder whether it was a deliberately angled response to those June study day discussions. This then took me back full circle to where my interest in Lubaina's aesthetic practices began. And that was, of course, in Kobina's brilliantly conceived essay for Shades of Black, Iconography After Identity. And I thought, if we're serious in our address to the tools of art history, in the recuperation of attention to the aesthetics of black British art, then why stop with Panofsky? Why not also invoke Wulflin? So at the very end of his seminal founding document for the history of art as an academic discipline, called The Principles of Art History, published in 1915, in which Wulflin sets out his schema for a trans-historical account of the evolution of style, Wulflin ends with the conclusion that, quote, the influence of one picture upon another is much more effective as a stylistic factor than anything deriving directly from the observation of nature. But yet, in Lubaina's words, the derivation is an illusion. Or in fact, is it? Interesting. I'm guessing that as an artist, you might want to say something along the lines of no shit. But as an art historical bread and butter, it nevertheless struck me that the kind of genealogy across images the basics of what art historians do, or purport to do, has actually not really been done much at all for black British art, other than the notable exceptions, most of whom are probably in this room already. Yes, Himid's overt arguments, dialogues, debts, and subversions with, to, and of modernism have been central to analyses of her work to date, but what about her other dialogues with other black British artists and their dialogues with her? Where is an art historical mapping of that genealogy? Whilst Maud Salter, more of whom in a moment, is perhaps an obvious source and an exception, the band study days also revealed further cross-generational dialogues, visual dialogues. Dialogues, I think, may be happening consciously or otherwise between, say, Gavin Yantes and Lubaina, and between Lubaina and Evan Ifakoya, to name just a couple of generational trajectories that emerged at the study days. Um, and I'm sure that there are numerous other um, sorts of kind of genealogies across black British art that are yet to be tapped. Um, and for me, um, now this may be way off beam, but for me what kind of emerged was this kind of visual, this is a Gavin Yanti's symbolic meal of 1985, which is in the government art collection. Um, and it just struck me that the sort of form, the colour, the sort of things at stake in this painting, um, this purport to still life, but yet with this sort of, map onto much greater sort of wider historical um, issues, these sort of floating crucifixes, which is an, a sort of theme in Gavin's work, um, um, certainly in the Corobra series. Um, that sort of very subtle ability of Gavin to sort of take something like a sort of still life of sort of African fruits um, and map it onto a sort of a, a make associations with much wider histories of sort of in, um, uh, yeah histories of kind of um, uh, slavery and migration um, and kind of death at sea um, and it sort of struck me that that there was an echo somehow with uh, five um, the last of uh, Lubena's magisterial series of uh, paintings called Revenge. Um, a mask in five tableau, which she showed at Rochdale Art Gallery in uh, 1991, um, and of which one of the series is actually in Tate Britain's collection. Um, and this series was very much Lubaina's head-on confrontation and address to modernism and disruption of modernism. Um, and I don't really have time to go into it in full detail today, but I thought there were some interesting things going on with these maps, with, with the, the two black women at the Parisian Café, one of them donning uh, Gertrude Stein's coat 
um, here and arguing um, around the table um, with this still life of sort of plates and bowls and cups and jugs, motifs that kind of go throughout the series um, with a map of Africa on, on one plate and a map of America on the other, sort of allusion to the American flag, at least, on the other. Um, and so, again, this idea that you're taking a sort of genre scene and um, inserting it into wider global histories, I think, is something that, that we can see in both Lubaina's and Gavin's work quite clearly. So another issue that struck me at the end of a study day was the issue of collage. Um, and I wasn't, unfortunately, here yesterday for uh, Cobbiner's um, talk, but I've heard lots of fabulous things about it, including his kind of reference to collage. So there's clearly, you know, things to be talked about, I think, in relation to collage as a modernist practice and a black aesthetic practice as well. So, yeah, so the, another thing that struck me was this issue of collage and how Lubaina deploys collage in her work. This is mentioned by at least two of the other participants at the study day, Jane Beckett and Christine Ien, and is something I'd like to pick up now further. In particular, Christine's focus on Lubaina's 2011-12 series of works, Kangas from the Lost Sample Book, made for the Whitworth's exhibition Cotton Global Threads um, in 2011-12, which sparked off a number of interesting points of curiosity for me. Um, but before I go into any details, I just wanted to run through quickly the rest of the Kanga series, or at least seven of the series. There's nine in total, and, and Lubaina often makes her series in series of nines, she tells me. Um, uh, but, but we only have um, seven of them. So this is one of them. Um, and they all, again, have these slogans, allow your friends to meet your enemies, and do the knots of poverty, don't forget me. Shelter in the shade of deep friendship. Leave the state of unbelonging. And finally, safety is the lost territory. The series derived from Lubaina's overall philosophy of working with museums, which is to find the thing in that collection that doesn't always get shown and then to use it as a starting point for new work, to make the invisible visible, and that's a kind of central motif in Lubaina's practice, to make a presence out of fragments. The Whitworth had a small collection of West African kangas, decorated rectangular cloths, usually bearing a slogan of some kind and worn by women. This was her starting point. The idea of the lost sample book stemmed from the decline of Manchester's textile industry and the likely disposal of its trappings, including the many hundreds of sample books containing patterns and designs now lost. And what she was particularly interested in was the fact that many of these designs from the textile industry in the sort of late 19th century um, were actually designs that were then exported to Africa um, and, and cloths that were made in Manchester, kangas that were made in Manchester and then exported to Africa. Um, um, rather than sort of the other way around. And she was interested in that sort of circle, that, that sort of cycle. She also had a collection of her own kangas, um, and she was sort of interested in her collection in relation to the Whitworth connect collection as well. So a sort of, um, uh, a sort of circular sort of idea of exchange between different collections and different traffics of, of, um, of, of goods across from Europe to Africa. The slogans on Lubaina's kangas are deliberately edgy, Indicative, as she says, not of a dangerous existence, but a fragile one. And they are, as she says, about how to keep going, how to survive, how to carry on, and about how to understand the change of life, its pitfalls, its dangers. But after she'd finished them, she realised that they needed to belong to someone, especially if she was going to engage audiences and start new conversations, which is another sort of main tenet of what she likes to do with her work. Her work is about making things visible that may be neglected and then starting a conversation about them with, with others, not necessarily normally gallery goers, um, sort of whoever, whoever in a sense wants to, wants to listen. She comments, quote, I wanted to take them from being from the lost sample book to a state of belonging. And when my father bought kangas for his mother and her friends to go to a wedding, they all had the same pattern. They went as a group. And so she makes this group of owners for these kangas. And I just want to quickly run through them all individually, because they're fantastic collages.
So each kanga has an owner, a woman who might have owned the piece and who now displays it as hers. And each woman is a collage, sourced from lots of different magazines, chopped up, and as Lubain has commented in an interview, made into, quote, a new woman, a new woman, or new women. Now, as an art historian who also specialises in Weimar culture, I simply couldn't pass this up. Collages of new women, and immediately what sprang to mind was, of course, Hannah Huch, and her particularly troubling series of photo montages entitled From an Ethnographic Museum that were made in the 1930s. But this, of course, was misplaced, wrong-footed, off-beam. How could Lubaina's beautiful women have derived anything from Hoch's messy colonialist project? Remember, the derivation is an illusion. No, Lubaina put me straight. Romare Bearden, Maud Salter. Ah, of course, I thought, Jeanne Duval. No, said Lubaina again, kindly but firmly. Circus. And this is um, one of uh, Maud Salter's uh, pieces for her series, Circus. Uh, this one's called Noir et Blanc, uh, Black and White One, of 1993. Yet Circus, produced by Maud in the 90s, returns me again instantly and insistently to Germany. One of Maud's most complex series of works, layered and supported with her poem Blood Money, inspired by photographs of black circus workers by German photographer Albert Sander, um, whose example I've put up here, and, and um, a, a photo montage of Sander's photograph appears on the back cover of Circus. It's the last image in, in the plate, and I'm always am amazed how um, Maud was able to get away with that by the Sander Foundation, because they're very rigorous about their um, uh, copyright over Sander. Um, but yeah, fair play to I know this because I've worked on Sander myself. <clears throat> So, yeah, so inspired by photographs of black circus workers by German photographer August Sander and speaking to the complex horrors of the history of black people in Germany before, during and after the Holocaust. Circus blows Hannah Huch's ethnographic series out of the water. And yes, of course, Romare Bearden, with his wonderful country woman here, that source of all hope, who is called upon repeatedly in Bearden's work to prepare love potions, cure illnesses and assist with personal problems. Yet once again, Dada echoes in the wings like an insistent return to origins. In Bearden's own words, it was my search for better ways of getting a social message into my cartoons, which led me to the works of Daumier, Forin, and Kirta Kolwitz, to the Art Students League, and to George Gross. What impressed me and challenged me most were the corrosive line drawings and the watercolours of George Gross. The drawings of Gross on the theme of the human situation in post-World War I Germany made me realise the artistic possibilities of black American subject matter. It was also Gross who led me to study composition. Everything I have done since then has been, in effect, an extension of my experiments with flat painting, shallow space, Byzantine stylization, and African design. And that was from Bearden's um, kind of now well-known rectangular structure in my montage paintings, a piece he wrote in the late 60s. For me, finding these reminiscences by Bearden was an eye-opening gem, a clear lineage from the German Dadaists to contemporary black British art, wasn't just about my own peculiarities of looking, the biases, inclinations and wishful thinking of my slightly odd biographically marked trajectory as an academic art historian of diasporic Indian heritage raised by Anglo-German parents, a post-colonial, post-Holocaust guilt child, as I like to suggest in my more cynical moments. <laughs> it was a thing, and it was a genuine one at that. So that's what Lubaina's work does for me at least, and hopefully for some of you. It opens up a realm of possibilities with the most economical of means. As Romy Smith commented also at the end of her study day, Lubaina's works are like a series of rooms or stanzas. Thought about poetically, they evoke Gavin Yanti's ideas about poetic language as a goal in his work, and in particular, his focus on the economy of language that the poetic demands, something also well understood by Maud Salter. Returning then um, to the Kangas and their owners, 
Another thing that art historians amongst us, my, the art historians amongst us mithered over during the study day was, of course, the source for this kanga, the shelter in the shade of deep friendship, the owner of this kanga, this figure here. Again, whilst for Lubaina the source was not especially relevant or important, more the evocation of an academic past in tribute to Maud's similar deployment of montage over so-called old master paintings in some of the works of circus. The deeper I dug, the more interesting this source became. Delacroix's portrait of the landscape painter Louis Auguste Schwitter, who I haven't found out yet much more about him, but his name, and he becomes a Baron, Baron von Schwitter later, um, uh, I think he's, he's probably a German as well. Um, but that's by the way. So the portrait was painted after Delacroix's return from London to Paris, and he entered it into the Salon of 1827, alongside his magisterial Death of Sardanapalus, which is a quintessential work of Romanticism. The Sardanapalus was accepted by the Salon, but the Schwitter was not. The Salon was obviously looking for something more extravagant in its Romantic painters that year. A port um, but nevertheless, the portrait of Schwitter remains an essay in Romanticism, a portrait of an aesthete and a dandy in sublime landscape, and one clearly admired by Degas, who subsequently bought the painting and owned it for a number of years. But more interestingly, and it's now in the National Gallery, by the way, so you can go and have a look at it. But more interestingly, what I particularly liked about this choice of artist by Lubaina, conscious or otherwise, was Baudelaire's description of Delacroix as a painter of, quote, the invisible, the impalpable, a painter of reverie, the nerves, the soul, which he does without any means other than contour and colour. So for me then, Baudelaire could easily have been talking about Lubaina there, um, and, so, um, and so it kind of comes full circle, this idea of derivation being an illusion, but yet constantly there, and I'm interested in that sort of cycle, really, um, and particularly in relation to this project, and particularly in relation to the brief that, that I was given to sort of think about Lubaina's practices in relation to modernism, and yet to have that troubled as well by, um, by the project, actually, on the study day itself. Um, and I have been shown the red card, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, but one of the things I sort of, I suppose, want to leave leave it with for discussion is is the discussion about collage and the use of collage, which I, I gather was kind of also talked about last night. Um, you know, what does collage do? What effects does it have? Um, it has a political and satirical effect. It has its origins in Dada, in Berlin Dada. Um, there's, a, there's an inherent dialectic of violence and suture involved in collage. You cut with a blade and then you stick it together again. Um, so you open wounds and you heal them and you make something new. Um, Lubaina's new women. And I think I will leave it there. Thank you, David. Thank you.